This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. The big question today is, where do our clothes come from? According to the Textile Exchange, which is a nonprofit that promotes climate change action in the apparel industry, 52% of our clothes are made from polyester. Fast fashion is an enormous industry. It allows us to purchase low-cost clothing quickly and efficiently. But the toll these companies take on the environment is significant, and the workplace conditions for the factories that create these products are questionable at best. But there are ways to slow down the fast fashion cycle and build better quality fabrics. Today, we'll talk about these solutions and what fashion brands can do to build sustainability. And here to talk about it is Mariah Kelly. She's an assistant professor of environmental science at Southern Connecticut State University, and Lucianne Tonti. She's a consultant for sustainable designers and author of Sundressed, Natural Fibers, and the Future of Fashion. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Uh, Mariah, I want to start with you. Can you give us an idea of what exactly is fast fashion? Um, well, when we think about, you know, what is fast fashion today, these are um, clothing and accessories that are produced, distributed, or manufactured uh, in unsustainable ways. Um, and, you know, in a simple way, we like to say that um, these are things that take more than they give back. Um, and we think about social, economic, and environmental factors when we think about um, the sustainability of these items over the entire life cycle um, of that. So that includes the, um, you know, how those fibers were manufactured or farmed, um, how that clothing was made um, and the energy sources and human rights issues associated with that through to distribution networks and um, channels of sending these items uh, throughout the world. And then I think something we're going to focus on a lot today is, you know, where those items actually go and the extent to which they're being um, recycled or reused uh, in a sustainable way. Um, and so, yeah, when we think about what is fast fashion today, yes, it's complicated um, because it starts from, you know, the beginning of growing those fibers and really ends um, all the way down to the, you know, how long these materials will stay in our environment. And so you kind of talked about a little bit earlier that fast fashion, I think, on some level, it is also accessibility. You know, more people can afford it, more people can get it. But it's not just inexpensive clothing brands that contribute to this. So, how do you think high fashion is is adding to this? Yes. Well, I think something that I, is really important for me to convey here is that it's it's necessary for us to recognize that what people wear is more than just a clothing item. Um, it's part of their identity. It's who they are. It's how they express themselves. And so I don't, I want to really emphasize the importance of that. And that's where I think the high fashion uh, versus low cost brands come into play and in how, you know, how people want to express their identities. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different things that people can really do to actually um, get those items that they want to wear and feel good about um, without having to break the bank or go to, um, you know, a primary source for those items. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things I advocate for is buying fewer things, but buying nicer things and really investing in pieces that make you feel good, but are also going to last a long time if you take care of them well. Um, and I personally have a, a favorite spot where I go, um, a local consignment store in Portland, Connecticut called Savvy Swap Consignment. Um, and I love supporting local businesses like this because not only do they have high end um, curated goods, um, but they'll work with you on your personal style and they'll um, style you so that you feel good um, and you're buying items that you know are going to last a long time, but that you're actually going to wear. I, that sounds like an amazing idea. And and because, you know, we have more access to these places and in and, and different levels. Um, but have we seen how the fashion industry is responding to this issue? You know, are we seeing more greenwashing, which makes it really hard to differentiate companies that are doing work to be sustainable and ethical and versus those who are not? I actually think we're seeing both. We are seeing um, certain companies and manufacturers greenwash and come up with what I would consider to be superficial or kind of performative measures that sort of trick the consumer into believing that they're actually 
uh, producing su sustainable goods or, or that they're doing the right thing by those goods when they're done um, being used. Um, but, you know, the reality is that, uh, you know, if we are focused on, you know, why this matters so much, and that is, you know, the impact on the environment and, um, you know, what we can do, then there's a lot, there's a lot there. You mentioned environmental impacts, and and I wonder, you know, how has deterring fast fashion impacted the sort of secondhand industry? You know, you also talked about shopping and consignment shops. I'm thinking there must be some sort of ripple effect as more people are moving towards that, maybe. Yes, I think people are, you know, shopping at some of these larger, especially chain consignment stores. Um, but one of the ways I think we can get around that, again, is to buy fewer items in general to just... Um, focus on buying less and then also, you know, taking care of the things that we have. Um, and certainly there have been impacts in costs at those chains, not only associated with the demand for those goods, but also, as I said, just um, increases and changes um, of how the system works. Um, and the way the system works means that things typically are costing more. And so, um, you know, that's no different uh, for uh, fashion items that you might buy from a large corporate chain as well. And what I want to bring in, Lucianne, uh, you are a consultant for sustainable designers. Can you talk about your love of your clothes and how did you get interested in textiles and how clothing is made? Yeah, sure. And I just want to jump in on a few things that were that we touched on um, in that discussion. So it's important that people understand that only at the moment, less than 1% of our clothes are actually recycled. So with that stat where you mentioned 80% of garments are being sent away, they're not, um, we don't have the infrastructure and the capacity at the moment to take those garments and turn them back into new textiles. So when you're buying something, um, you've really got to keep in mind <laughs> the impact that that's going to have on the planet. Um, and in terms of fast fashion, I think the definition really needs to account for how many thousands and thousands of units these companies are able to put online and into their stores every week. So that's the change we've seen in the last 20 years when free trade came through. Now these companies are able to literally manufacture tens of thousands of goods a week and to distribute them online. So that wasn't the case before we opened up manufacturing to other parts of the world, but it certainly is the case now, so much so that we consume 60% more clothes now than we did in the year 2000, and that consumption is accelerating. So by the year 2030, we'll be consuming 60% more than we are now. So it's an enormous amount of, of goods. <laughs> but to your question, <laughs> sorry to go off track no, already. we love it. Um, to your question, so my love of clothes, like, I, you know, I, I've worked in fashion since I was 17. Um, and as I kind of, you know, made my way up through the industry, I started working for fast fashion brands. And then over time, you know, by the time I was in my early 20s, I was working for um, a high end designer in Australia that um, worked predominantly with natural fibers and manufactured locally. And that really um, put me on a different track in the way I was kind of thinking about clothes. By the time I, I, I lived in London and then by the time I got to Paris, I was working um, exclusively for um, designers who only worked with natural fibres and really what the quality of the garments that they were producing was so beautiful. Um, it really, um, and they were so militant about not having any synthetics because, um, you know, I, I, I say this a lot, so I feel like everyone should know it by now, but I know it's not common knowledge. Polyester, nylon, these are plastics. These are common plastics that are derived from fossil fuels. And so when you um, are thinking about your garments, uh, at the moment we know that polyester makes up, synthetics make up over 52% of all the fibres produced. Um, and that is, you know, polyester is really hard to recycle. As I said, less than 1% of our clothes are recycled. And that doesn't buy it a grade. So when that sits in landfill, that um, it'll sit in landfill for hundreds of years. So what we, with natural fibers, we have uh, so many wonderful benefits. Not only are they more beautiful to wear, but they also will buy it a grade and return to um, the earth at the end of their life, depending on how they're disposed of. But we also have these fabulous opportunities with the way that they're grown because um, 
they come from the soil. So, you know, whether, whether it's wool or cotton or, or linen, um, hemp, silk, even all of these garments, when if we change the way that we farm them and if we move off an industrial farming system, these fibres have the capacity to regenerate landscapes. And that's... Um, that's kind of where I've gotten to now on this kind of journey where it's looking for the most beautiful clothes that have also these wonderful benefits for the planet. Well, and beautiful clothes also mean, you know, how we treat it and how it makes us feel. And Mariah mentioned this earlier, how, you know, a lot of us, we, you know, we wear our clothes to feel good or maybe they it holds memories and make us feel a certain way. Can you talk about the emotional weight that we put on our clothes? You know, not just something like a, a wedding dress, but even how a sweater can be attached to a memory. And I think in your book, you talked about your favorite black dress. Yeah, I mean, look, I think this is a really important part of the consumption piece because we need to reduce our consumption if we're going to have um, changed the carbon footprint of the fashion industry. So, uh, you know, our clothes are, I just, are, are like our most intimate companions. You know, they come with us everywhere. They're next to our skin. They um, they can change the way we feel, not just physically by keeping us warm or, or you know, letting us breathe if if um if it's too hot outside, but also the way that we feel, how confident we feel, how comfortable we are when we're like walking into a you know um, an exciting situation, a tricky situation, a nerve wracking situation. They have a a really powerful um, ability to you know, to kind of carry us through these different challenging events of our, in our lives. And I think that those, you know, when I think about the garments that I've, that I love and that I, that I cherish, it's garments that function in two ways for me. They make me feel, you know, beautiful and they also are comfortable. And so there's a confidence element to um, my experience of wearing them that makes them, you know, makes me feel like they're my friends and I want them to. And I, I think when we start, when we change the way we think about our clothes and start to view them as these kind of friends that we need to take care of that will then take care of us, we start to value them more. We, we keep them for longer. You know, we'll take them to get repaired. We'll make sure they go to the dry cleaners. You know, we'll, we'll sew that button back on if it falls off. And all of those things um, feed into uh, having a wardrobe that, you know, is functional, that you feel good in, that you're excited to wear every morning and that you're not kind of constantly seeking out that new purchase, um, that new kind of dopamine hit because, you know, you're, you're kind of viewing them, every purchase as something that needs to carry you through um, years and years and years. So it's not going to be something you take lightly. I love that idea of viewing your clothing as friends. I'm not sure if I've heard that before. So this is a life changing moment, <laughs> Lucien. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and talking about that, it's it's uh, you know we've been talking about where you can find your clothes. Um, can you talk about also the challenge of finding quality, sustainable clothing? Because as we mentioned earlier, lots of brands can be at a higher price point with limited quantities and. Um, when everything is so available through fast fashion, you know, there's a reason why we gravitate towards that. Can you talk about your thoughts on that? Yeah. So look, uh, uh, it's a few things and it's a tricky area, especially when we're in a cost of living crisis and the prices of everything are going up. Um, but our clothes should be more expensive than we're used to them being. Like, unfortunately, what's happened with fast fashion is uh, in the last, you know, two or three decades, as Mariah mentioned, of um, accelerated cheap clothing is that we've become conditioned to think that a t-shirt can can cost ten dollars and there's and that's okay when the true cost of a t-shirt is really a lot more than that because of how precious the materials are when they're coming out of the ground the time and the labor and the creativity that goes into producing um that, that garment and then you know you've got to factor in everything else, the, the cost of the retail, the cost of the, you know, manufacturing website, all of the things. So um, it's a really uh, an important piece of this is understanding that uh, it's, we've got to a monetary investment in something of higher quality that you'll keep for a long time is something worthwhile. You know, <clears throat> I use the example of a fridge a lot. I like, 
you wouldn't want to buy a new fridge every six months because you bought a cheap one <laughs> and it needed to be replaced. That would be so annoying, right? Our clothes, we need to view in the same way. Like we, we don't want to be, um, when you buy the cheap t-shirt and then because it's made of polyester, because as I said, it's made of plastic, um, polyester has a complicated relationship with sweat and with oil. Um, because it comes from oil, it'll bond when it can't when it comes into contact with those two things, which means that it will hold on to your body odor. And you'll know everyone that's worn polyester knows that, you know, is to be true. But it will also hold on to stains. And those are two things very quickly that mean you don't want to wear that garment. You don't want to wear something that stinks <laughs> and you don't want to wear something that looks dirty. And then of course, what are you doing? You're reaching for the next cheap thing. So when we're in that kind of cycle of consumption, I actually believe not only are we feeling extremely dissatisfied with our wardrobes and overwhelmed because we're looking at kind of mountains of things that we've purchased that we can't wear and there's a lot of complicated emotions, regret, guilt, shame <laughs> tied up in, in that kind of scenario and then and frustration because you're like, I don't have anything to wear. And then the second thing is... Um, you end up spending more money, <laughs> but, but but you're feeling dissatisfied. So if we slow down and save up <laughs> for pieces that we really want, that we've really considered that are higher quality, that we are investing in for the long term, that's when um, we can kind of shift those patterns of consumption and kind of turn back the wheel a little bit and get off this kind of notion of like, one more new thing, the next new thing. Oh, now it's, you know, it smells and it's and it's got a stain on it and I need something else. Like, um, and really start to view our clothes as a, a kind of different avenue for investing, just as we would with anything else in our lives. You know, we can we take such a long time to make a purchase, a bigger purchase, like uh, an appliance, a car, you know, all these things. And uh, obviously I'm not expecting you to spend what you would spend on a car on your clothes, but it's that kind of thinking where you do your research, you want to buy the some, a high quality thing that won't have to be repaired every, you know, every so often you want it to stand the test of time. You want it to hold its value so you can resell it potentially. Um, and it's undoing the kind of patterns of, you um, consumption that we've all been we've all adopted now with fast fashion and I think it's important to keep in mind two decades is not that long we can unlearn these habits absolutely but it will take a little bit of resistance and some kind of cognitive behavioral <laughs> tricks as well well, slowing down and saving up is what we need to do, it sounds like. You've been listening to Lucy Antonti, who is a consultant for sustainable designers and author of Sundressed, Natural Fibers and the Future of Fashion, as well as Mariah Kelly. She's an assistant professor of environmental science at Southern Connecticut State University. They will both be staying with us to continue our talk about fast fashion, where our fabrics come from, and how to create better clothing. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We're back with Mariah Kelly. She's an assistant professor of environmental science at Southern Connecticut State University and Lucianne Tonti. She's a consultant for sustainable designers and author of Sundressed, Natural Fibers and the Future of Fashion. We've been chatting about the fast fashion cycle and how it impacts the way we buy our clothes. It also creates questions on where our fabrics come from and how a deeper understanding could help us create and buy better clothing. Uh, Luciana, I want to start with you. It seems like we've kind of been talking about what would really make an impact if in fashion is you have to start with how the clothes are made with agriculture. So how we grow cotton, for example, is a big part of this. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, the way we farm natural fibers is, you know, it obviously varies depending on um, what type of fiber. So say with cotton, uh, it, like classic industrial cotton farming that's kind of evolved over the last century or two uh, is can be extremely resource hungry and um, polluting. So we grow cotton in monocultures mostly around the world, which requires a lot of water and a lot of pesticides and a lot of fertilizers. However, <laughs> this is where it gets interesting because 
uh, we have the capacity with cotton to grow it in a way that regenerates the landscapes, restores biodiversity, uh, soil health. Um, and when we do those two things, what we're actually doing is sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere and returning it to the soil. And I don't want to, I'm, Mariah can probably speak more to the carbon science and um, with more expertise than me, but essentially, you know, what the problem is at the moment with global warming, we have too much carbon in the atmosphere, the soil and plants are a much better place for carbon to be. So when we think about cotton farming and its potential, we really do have kind of amazing opportunities to be growing not just organic cotton. That's like step number one. We've got to stop spraying these toxic chemicals, fertilizers and pesticides. Um, but number two, we, we um when we are in, in re restoring biodiversity on these landscapes, that's like critical to our ability to like not use both of those chemicals because we need different plants to be drawing nutrients down into the soil to ha have it have so that it has a healthy microbial life so that we don't have to rely on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. And if the multifaceted benefit of that is that then you start to bring in more diverse species like birds and pollinators who will then also create a healthy ecosystem which has uh, a multitude of benefits not just for the farmers working those landscapes but also for the quality of the cotton that you're growing so um, cotton grown on a regenerative farm generally you're getting better yields than you would in industrial agriculture over the very long term because what happens when we use fertilizers and pesticides is that we destroy the soil and we need more and more of these chemicals to get the same returns. Whereas with regenerative agriculture, what we're doing is really improving and um, the health of the land so that it can kind of be self-sustaining and kind of let nature take its proper course. And the beautiful thing about these landscapes, if you speak to and visit any kind of farmer that's working regeneratively is is just like how it feels. It's visceral when you're on those landscapes. It, you can hear the birds and the bees. You can see the wildlife, the trees. You can feel it in the soil because healthy soil smells different. You know, you can see it, the greenery and kind of how alive these landscapes are. And it's extremely different <laughs> to, to industrial agriculture where you kind of viewing just field after field of the same crop with not a tree in sight. So what I love about um, cotton is it's just, it's really this kind of miracle fiber. Like, you know, I, I, it's got a, obviously an extremely complicated history, not just in America and, you know, other places around the world too, but it is, it comes off the plant bright, white and fluffy and ready to be spun. And when it's on the body, it breathes, it uh, is it super absorbent and we can turn it into so many different kind of beautiful variations of fabric. So it's really a, a very special, valuable commodity. And when we have farm, when we view it as something that we can use as a tool to regenerate landscapes and kind of heal the earth and sequester carbon out of the atmosphere, it just becomes this kind of it gets me very excited <laughs> if you can't hear it in my voice. <laughs> well, I want to ask, you know, channeling your excitement, I also want to ask Mariah to respond to this. You know, agriculture clearly plays a huge role in where our clothing comes from. You know, what are your thoughts about this? Yes, these are really good points that Lucian has made here. Um, and we know that um, right now, currently, according to the World Economic Forum, about 10 percent of global climate emissions annually are related to fast fashion industries. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons why in our climate work we are concerned about this is because, um, you know, the current system that we have, again, if you think about the life cycle of these items, you know, beginning with that farming process, you know, that's going to, um, in the case of, of monoculture uh, growing of plants, is going to strip carbon from the soil. And if it's not done in a regenerative way, like Lucian is saying, it takes a long time for that soil to kind of come back to life and have the carbon sequestration value that it needs to do that service um, for our planet. But also, um, I think I would like to bring in the fact that it's not just the carbon emissions, it's also um, in our climate work, even though uh, methane is a smaller amount of the carbon emission, uh, the total global emissions, 
um, it is um, much more potent. Mm -hmm. And so with animal agriculture, we don't just think about, um, you know, the impacts in terms of carbon and carbon sequestration and carbon release, um, but also methane release and, and things related to animal agriculture um, and related um, manufacturing processes. So really the system that we currently have, you know, if you uh, go across the life cycle of those items, beginning with farming, you know, you have a system that is stripping carbon from the soil. Uh, relies on fossil fuels as an energy source in the manufacturing process. Um, and also we acknowledge that, you know, human rights and, and climate justice are, are interlinked. And so when we think about the manufacturing processes, thinking about human rights and its role in addressing climate change as well. And then we have distribution networks that rely on fossil fueled um, forms of shipping and trade. Um, and then at the end of the day, kind of what we were talking about earlier, you know, where do those items go is even worse for climate change. Um, in many cases, those items are sent to incinerators where they're burned, which also releases um, fossil fuels or uh, emissions. And then, you know, it might go to a landfill where it leaches toxic chemicals and possibly microfibers into the soil, which eventually um, ends up in, in rivers and streams and ultimately our ocean. Um, which has become a, a hot topic these days about, you know, microplastics in the ocean, uh, which is certainly linked to the degradation of these um, items in our environment. Well, I was going to say, we've been talking a lot about materials and, and, and them end, ended up in incinerators and landfills. We do have a question on Twitter. Uh, someone's asking, are fabrics like rayon, bamboo, and tensile considered natural fibers? And is there a range of how sustainably they are produced? So there, those are all kinds of viscose rayon. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, so viscose rayon is derived from trees. And so, well, it's derived from cellulose, but at the moment it's derived from mostly from trees or from bamboo. And so there is a huge... It's an extremely complicated area, but there's many different types that fall under the umbrella of viscose rayon. Bamboo is one, modal is one, tensile, lyocell, rayon, viscose, cupro is another one. And so what's important to understand about all of these different types of fabric is that currently the way that they are manufactured is by cutting down trees, which is extremely problematic in the fight against global warming. Um, and then the tree is turned into wood pulp, which is then dissolved in traditional viscose manufacturing in sulfuric acid, which turns it into a viscose substance that is then spun into and woven into a textile. So in, in the worst type of viscose rayon, up to 70% of the tree is wasted. So not only are we cutting down ancient and endangered forests. <laughs> half, there's 200 million trees are cut down every year to make viscose rayon, and over half of them come from ancient and endangered forests, which is gut-wrenching <laughs> when, when you think about, you know, forests, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the world's biodiversity is in our forests, and, you know, obviously forests are enormous carbon sinks, so we need trees to be left standing in the ground. The other half come from what we call sustainably managed forests. And so if you're looking for a more a, a, a viscose rayon that you can feel better about, you need to look for one that is FSC or PEFC certified. So that guarantees the chain of custody so that we know they didn't come from an ancient or endangered forest. But in my opinion, <laughs> um, we shouldn't be cutting down any trees. I've been to sustainably managed forests. They don't make me feel the way that, uh, you know, old growth forests make me feel when you're walking through a forest we know that it can have enormous health benefits you know because of the way that the trees kind of calm your heart and obviously also being surrounded by nature we need these um you know vital um habitats in the world so the best kind of viscose rayon this is a long answer and probably more than your twitter um <laughs> question questioner wanted to know but what we need to do is transition all of our viscose rayon off trees and bamboo included because bamboo is equally linked to deforestation. And 
um, we can actually make viscose rayon from any kind of cellulose. And that could be agricultural waste. They can make it with food waste. They can make it with cotton waste, which is like fabulous. They could do it. We could do it with hemp, which is an incredible crop and fiber to grow because what you need is the cellulose content. It doesn't have to come from a tree. And we have so many other wonderful, um, you know, you can make it with coconut water. Like there's so many um, amazing alternatives and, ways, things that we can lean into. So technically what we're talking about are man-made cellulosics. They will breathe. They don't provide that much warmth when you're wearing them, but in terms of say, um, they're great for lining because they're super durable and they can be turned into very silky fibers and they will biodegrade at um, their end of life. So in a perfect world, when we're moving forward, we would stop cutting down forests full stop to make dresses. And then secondly, um, we would transition to using different kinds of waste to create these fabrics. I'm not anti um, viscose as a textile with in terms of the, its properties, and I love that it will biodegrade. And I think there's huge capacity for us to really be doing something good here because all of the clothes that we were talking about getting sent to landfill before, any of them that are made from a natural fiber, what, from a plant-based fiber, so cotton, hemp, linen, could be turned into viscose rayon. So there's this like hopeful kind of um, path to go down here. But at the moment, it's really important people understand that most viscose rayon comes from trees. <laughs> and when we're talking about sustainability, that's obviously an enormous issue. We've been hearing from Mariah Carrot Kelly, Assistant Professor of Environmental Science, and Lucien Tonti, who is a consultant for sustainable designers. When we come back, the founder of a local business here in Connecticut will share her experience on how to practice sustainability with our clothes while having a good time doing it. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We're jumping straight back with Yasmin Ugorlu. She is the founder and owner of Reboot Eco, and she joins us now to share her experiences on opening a zero-waste shop. Thanks so much for joining us today, Yasmin. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I just want to go straight to it. You know, what started Reboot Eco, how, and also how did it end up having a swap shop or a swap studio? Mm-hmm. So Reboot Eco uh, started in response to it's a, a zero waste and refill shop, and it uh, started in response to you know the problem of, of plastic and single use and, and lots of uh, uh, the environmental issues that are discussed today and, and otherwise. Uh, and we offer, in addition to of course uh, those plastic free alternatives and uh, sustainable products, we uh, have a lot of uh, community initiatives to familiarize folks with free ways to live more responsibly. And one of those uh, started out as swap parties uh, to you know get folks more familiar with uh, just kind of, you know, building community and swapping clothes and uh, finding new to them clothes and and finding new homes for their uh, cherished items. Uh, And what started, you know, almost two years ago as monthly swap parties has now turned into uh, a full uh, brick and mortar uh, swap studio, our our free shop, uh, which is open uh, once a week now as of the beginning of this year. Uh, and just continues to grow and build on that uh, community movement to just bring us all together and uh, and have fun shopping experiences that are completely free. Well, I think we all love a little fun shopping and some free shopping. And is this something that started with cleansing products, I think, and kind of extended to close? Or what was that process like for you opening Reboot Eco? Uh, so it started with uh, the problem around plastic. So uh, household cleaners and bath products are, uh, you know, really difficult to get. Uh, not only uh, non, you know, non toxic as 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 you spoke about in an episode last week. Uh, not only without the toxic ingredients, but also packaged in a way uh, that's sustainable. So avoiding uh, the single use plastic that doesn't really get recycled, uh, uh, and 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 being able to refill and reuse and uh, repurpose uh, containers that folks already have at home, uh, and being able to. Re- refill those and buying locally made reusable items rather to replace single use items such as paper towels, etc. So it started with that. uh, And then, you know, as as one starts to look at one aspect of sustainability and one aspect of their their lives and and, and their uh, retail choices, uh, how they are, you know, not only voting with their dollar, but how they're shopping and what they're what they're buying and looking at ingredients or or packaging and such. It's, you know, it's a very quick path then to things like 
problems like fast fashion uh, and, and other environmental issues. So uh, the, the the swap parties were pretty early uh, add on uh, a program of, of Reboot Eco just because it's such a huge uh, problem and in the, uh, um, my customer base, the, the community that's that's uh, formed around Reboot Eco was really invested in having alternatives uh, and and having those you know regularly uh, 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 available, readily available and regularly occurring uh, events. So sounds like so much fun things going on. You know, what is the energy like in Swap Studios? You know, what are what are people saying? What are people feeling when they come in? Well, I have to say, uh, before I directly answer that, uh, two of the uh, main benefits that that our Swap Studio addresses were actually addressed earlier uh, earlier in this uh, episode. One of them being what Lucienne had mentioned regarding clothes, you know, really holding meaning and then being like friends. Uh, and when you know when you have some of these clothes that really you know prompt memories or or really mean something to you, but they just don't fit anymore, you know we end up holding on to things for for longer than necessary just because we can't bear to part with them, and we can't bear to just you know drop it off at, at Goodwill or something like that just because you know it meant something to you and you don't want to just part with it. But it's so much easier to part with it in 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 a place like our swap studio where you know that someone else in your community is going to be getting joy out of it, and that just feels a lot different. They don't have to pay for it. They're going to be able to get it for free and kind of be able to carry on that that good juju, if you will. That's you know in that in that fabric in that item. And then the other one uh, is that it addresses uh, you know the, the the problem of overconsumption. And I think you know per again. Um, both uh, Miriam and Lucien made this. Uh, Mariah, I'm sorry, and, and Lucien made this. Um, made these points around around overconsumption and and needing to shop more responsibly and and needing to buy quality. You know, uh, quality over quantity as well as uh, you know such. I think th there'd be some listeners that would say, well, that's 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 all well and good, but I can't afford to, right? I can't just afford to just suddenly start to buy these quality, long-lasting uh, products. And because Reboot Eco is so solu uh, solution-focused and we like to offer solutions, and while I 100% agree and that, you know, quality is necessary, sometimes, you know, a transition might be necessary. And I think that Reboot Eco Swap Studio is a great transitional uh, place where uh, you can start to acquire, you know, uh, wean yourself off of you know the habits of overconsumption that we have uh, so you can really start to acquire a variety of things for free which then frees up some of that you know <laughs> some of that shopping budget that you might have to really then be able to invest in these uh, uh, uh kind of long term uh, uh, uh these items that will stay with you for a while and they might have you know a retail value later on so it makes that easier and especially when you're considering kids or teenagers you know kids it can be really hard to shop for kids that are constantly growing. So we have all these kids clothes that can at least help supplement, you know, those needs or at least uh, help as as folks uh, seek out better quality, uh, better quality options. But to that point, it's so much fun. And it's like, you know, we have a lot of like minded folks inside the swap studio and and, you know, they're coming and they're parting with these items. And sometimes we have folks that are lucky enough to be in the space when someone else picks up the item they just brought in. And just, I mean, I get goosebumps every time I talk about it because it's just so rewarding and it feels so good to see that someone is carrying on that joy and carrying on and taking on, uh, you know, bring it, it, that, that a piece is going to bring them just as much joy as it's brought you. And it's just, it's just fun. And shopping is made fun again and less stressful and less, you know, budget minded and, and, and just less of a problem and more of a solution. Well, I love that you mentioned the the relationship because Lucia mentioned earlier too. It's like have clothing is like your friends, and you're sort of ex, uh, extending that friendship to other people. And both Luc uh, Lucia and Mariah had mentioned, you know, the true cost of these items, whether it's labor or creativity or environment. And that's clearly in your mind. Uh, we got about two minutes left. I do want to ask now, how has this changed your relationship with clothes? So it's definitely improved it, I have to say. I have uh, historically, it, it's, shopping has been always quite stressful. I, I've, I've always, you know, in, in when I was uh, growing up and trying to find my style, I didn't have a lot of available, uh, you know, budget to be to be really going through and trying out the different styles and things like that. So I kind of just stayed more boring and basic and safe, if you will. But now, uh, you know, just me being able to, you know, regularly obviously be in the space I'm able to experiment a little bit more comfortably and I'm able to find more joy out of putting together maybe slightly more daring, uh, you know, ensembles and, and, and just, uh, and then, you know, I've got a little bit more uh, availability now to shop for these 
higher quality items, which I have, you know, done, but it also, it means it's a smaller wardrobe, which is great. But sometimes it's nice to have some pieces moving through, you know, to kind of keep things fresh and exciting and fun. And I, I, I now, you know, I'm able to uh, show my personality more and kind of present myself more. And, you know, I also, we like to at Reboot Eco kind of promote the conscious outfit of the day on social media. So, you know, the hashtag COOTD. So it's kind of, you know, it, it, it gets me to, to be a little bit more daring so I can share with people that, you know, I can have this fun, you know, potentially, I don't know if it's always stylish, but, you know, potentially stylish outfit. And it's all either secondhand, thrifted, hand-me-downs, free, you know, uh, or just a really long lasting item that's going to stick around for a while or already has. Well, I want to thank uh, Yasmin Ugarlu for be- bringing all the good, good juju to the show and to the community today. She's the founder and owner of Reboot Eco. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. You've also been listening to Mariah Kelly, who's the Assistant Professor of Environmental Science at Southern Connecticut State University, and Lucianne Tonti, who is a consultant for sustainable designers and author of Sundress, Natural Fibers and the Future of Fashion. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs>